the company is facing bankruptcy. And then my son, who suffered from depression, had been bullied that day and came home, uh, took the car and had passed my CFO, who was taking his belongings home from the office. And uh, my son rolled over in a police chase and died. Okay. Uh, Dan Cooper here again with Return on Character podcast. I am the CEO or founder of Rock Investments, which allocates capital on the basis of the character of public company CEOs. Uh, we have this podcast to be able to highlight individuals that, you know, shorthand make me better as a human being for knowing them. Uh, and today we have, I have the great honor of having uh, Mel Torrey, CEO and founder of ASI, uh, and I'm going to have him explain what you do uh, in the world with your company and so on. But but just so listeners understand, um, never have I been sent a, a, a video of a guest, watched it for an hour, and then forwarded it on to my, my entire board of directors and closest friends because I believed it was such a cherished nugget uh, that it would, would benefit them uh, in a significant way. And I did that with Mel's, uh, some of his publicly available videos. Uh, honestly, guys, uh, it's such a, a treat to, an honor to have Mel with us. Um, he, he is an example of what I would term uh, a high character CEO, the one that we wish we could invest in uh, all day long, every day. And uh, welcome to the show, Mel. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. Thanks, Dan. Those are kind uh, words from the legend. That's uh, humbling. I sure appreciate it. Oh, no. Well, listen, Mel, for the sake of starting the story, would you, would you mind tell us, telling us at the beginning your, your entrepreneurial journey and where you started and, and how you ended up developing a little bit uh, ASI today? And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, we, let's see, I guess first raised on a farm in Canada and so got early taste to bankers and the, the burdens of making those payments, selling the cows, selling the wheat and trying to, to keep them at bay. And so that was my early exposure to debt and quite a compelling one, but then went to university and got into a robotics lab, wrote a paper about robotic safety. And John Deere came and asked if I could kind of move some of those things we we're doing in a paper onto a tractor and show that we could make uh, safe farming equipment automated. And that was about 23 years ago. And we spun the company out, brought a couple of professors, a couple of students and began the journey and one of the John Deere directors of research sat me down in a restaurant and he shared on a napkin, the Clayton Christensen innovators dilemma and that general need for these big billion dollar companies to have help in overcoming some of the inertia, some of those internal challenges being public companies and quarterly earnings and those kind of things to help them. I don't want to say kick their own butt, but disrupt themselves and keep their technology evolving and not get disrupted in the marketplace as the book shares. And so he shared that. And I basically took that onto a slide deck and have been able to raise a couple hundred million through that slide by going to the world's largest uh, industrial monster companies that are public, that struggle to automate their industrial vehicles. So monster mining trucks, farm tractors, construction equipment, material handling, and some automotive. So basically raised bootstrapped uh, instead of taking investors and built a company around that solving the innovator's dilemma for the monster company. Can you give us an example of the utilization of the product development that you use? Uh, and it's more kind of fascinating 
any maybe app application that others may not be familiar with? Well, in in Australia, in mining in general, we automate the equipment and the trucks are the are the biggest labor challenge because they just can't get the labor. And so we automate the world's largest vehicles, 400 ton to drive by themselves and move material. And right now companies are parking trucks because they can't get the workers. And so we've automated fleets in Africa, in the Ukraine. Those are on pause right now, understandably. And uh, we just won the largest autonomous mine contract in the world down in Australia. And one of the challenges there is they have to fly in for two weeks and then fly home for two weeks. And they really struggle to get people who are willing to do that, to be away from their families and, and work those kinds of hours. And so now we've automated their mining solution and we're working through, they have uh, 300 vehicles and we're working through those additional vehicles. And now those people go to the office in Perth and run the equipment from a video game like console from the 800,000 miles away and they get to be with their kids in the evenings. And so they've retrained their truck drivers. Uh, so now they are managers and operators of this system instead of driving in a truck back and forth uh, 12 hour shifts. And these aren't little trucks. These are giant, yeah, like building sized trucks, right? Yes, they've been known to run over pickup trucks and not realize it, uh, back over them, completely crush them, and had to be called on the radio and let them know that you've crushed my pickup truck. Uh, and, and so they're, they're monsters, <laughs> 400 tons plus 400 tons of payload. So it takes two football fields to stop them when they're traveling. Wow. Yeah. So, so that example, so we do that. Uh, in the mining industry where they can't find workers in construction, automotive, agriculture, and make those solutions optimal in fuel and compaction to soil and things like that to move material and optimize their production system, whatever that might be. We're also doing golf course mowers right now, so we'll be releasing those this year uh, for these golf courses that can't find enough labor. So. Lots of labor challenges going on. Yeah, which coincides well with your business. Um, you know, from the outside, Mel, it looks like your your life has been just a steady stream upward uh, of perfectness. Yes. Um, uh, and and you got a successful business. You're working with giant companies. Uh, you you have a nice family. I mean. Um, do you, would you mind sharing with us some of the more challenging moments within the business maybe that you had and, and just how you got over, overcame them. And, um, I'd love to hear, maybe I, I, a better way of saying it would be character defining moments within your business career. That's kind of got you to where you are today. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I could share the biggie. In 2008, we were on a really nice trajectory and then the global recession hit and pretty well every one of our industries dropped our big mining partners. One of them laid off 16,000 people within a three or four week period. And so we were hiring and scaling like crazy and in this bootstrapped way where the end users are paying because they need the solution. And to a point where we just lost everything except some government research contracts. And so we're struggling. We had our CFO looking at where things are headed and he resigned. He helped uh, let some people go. We waited till the last minute and finally had no other option but to let some people go. Luckily, we were able to hire a bunch of them back. But as our CFO was packing up his belongings and hauling them off in his car to head home uh, because the company's outlook was that bad. He passed my son on the way to his death. And so it was quite a culmination of the company is facing bankruptcy 
And then my son, who suffered from depression, had been bullied that day and came home, uh, took the car, and had passed my CFO, who was taking his belongings home from the office. And uh, my son rolled over in a police chase and died. So that was quite quite a synchronization of challenges from losing a family member and not being able to make payroll. And so we had to use his life insurance policy to make a payroll. Then we had to use his, the suburban that he destroyed insurance to cover the next payroll and took us a year and a half to afford a tombstone for him. So it was quite a journey as we struggled through that as many people did. Uh, but yeah, quite a, quite a journey in prioritization in what's really important. And I think there was some character growth there. I think maybe some confidence coming as the company was taking off and scaling and then some forced humility as, as we face that. And I think really all of those character traits that you've talked about, the big four really came to define what we tried to become that, uh, pain really helped build those kinds of muscles that, uh, those kinds of things can do. They can either help you make you stronger or they can put you into a tailspin and we're very fortunate to become better through it all. I, um, yeah, I don't know how a human being doesn't go into the fetal position and in the closet, you know, after something like that. Um, yeah. How was it with your team uh, when they both saw you um, personally grieving going through the loss of your son and then also the, the, the challenges within the organization, which is to actually keep supporting them, right? Yeah. Um, how did, how, how was it? How was it within the organization during the, during this, this difficult time? I think one of the first things is that they really came to my rescue and really offered anything we can do. We, we've got your back at the business. Uh, you take your time and so a lot of compassion and then as we had to let some of them go, we had to let go of about 75% of the company. It really was, they knew that we did everything possible, that we waited as long as we could. We tried every avenue we could. When my son died, I was flying to Canada to the world's largest gold mining company to sell them a robotic bulldozer and got stuck in a snowstorm and listened to my son's last heartbeat as they took him off a of life support on a cell phone in the middle of a Wyoming snow storm. I was heading home and the, the important thing was that they knew that they were a priority and that it was not in the name of profitability and hitting some number we sacrificed until there was no other option, either shut the doors or let them go. So they were incredibly gracious and kind, those that we had to let go. And as I said, how reaffirming it was that we were, they were willing to come back uh, because they did know that we cared and that it was something we really, really didn't want to do. I know that you personally, I mean, were grieving also, you're financially under incredible personal stress. I mean, that's not just you, it's your wife, right? Uh, and, and your wife being married to an entrepreneur, you know, my mom, my wife had to deal with a guy that said, honey, uh, everything will be okay. We're going to go build railroads in Africa. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, there's a certain special kind of woman that can do that. Um, how how'd you manage through that? You know, with your wife and, and then tell us a little bit of how, how you came out of it, um, on the other side and, and what was it that kind of pointed you eventually through the whole process, both you know, personally and then the business? Uh, great question. Uh, my wife's definitely the reason we're still in business. 
And so we've had kind of three near-death experiences and every time she's stepped in to be the CFO. So as the CFOs ran off or wandered off or sadly went off, she came in, worked without salary and really pulled through and then just willing to bet everything and just crazy. Uh, the gratitude, I, I think of one of those near-death experiences where we had mortgaged everything, all the credit cards, the house, the, like I said, delaying tombstones and everything to keep this company alive and this fantasy that Mel's chasing. And, and we have this mantra that we talk about where seek to understand, seek to be understood, and then get on board with the second best decision like it was your own. And she came to me after we'd mortgaged everything. There was nothing. The banks were maxed out and they said, we can't support another payroll, you're done. And she broke down to me and said, I can't get on board with the second best decision. I'm out. I can't go in anymore. And then the next morning she said, I just realized we can take a loan against our 401k. I, it is now in process. And so that kind of love and support, like you can't, you can't put a value on it. So yeah, what incredible gratitude that to go from those kind of situations where there's no way, there's no path forward. Everyone has said you can't make it. And she was willing to dig in and just be next to me and support me in that. And then to be able to, to pull through those and then to get to much better places, such a validation of her faith and support. So that, so that's kind of the side, just <clears throat> incredible uh, selfless trust and uh, sacrifice, just the, the burden of that as most entrepreneurs, you have those near death experiences and you have maxed everything. And it seems like that's part of the muscle ripping muscle building part of the journey is it's building those, those tools, those strengths. And we got better through every one of those. And that's really where we came to go on our personal life as well, because as I was pondering losing my son, I was reading some of these experiences people have gone through in trials and, and trying to learn and just how do people get through this and read this one story of this man who had cystic fibrosis and was in a a tailspin as far as his body shutting down and surgery after surgery and losing a function. And he had a dream after one of these nasty surgeries. And he saw this guy explaining why we come to earth uh, up at the whiteboard and that there are some options for fast tracking the learning that you need in this life and those things that will help you reach your potential. And one of those was cystic fibrosis. And the person in the room asked if there were any volunteers. And he saw himself in the back of the room, raise his hand and said, Hey, I want that challenge because I want to reach my potential. And, and then just how transformative that was in his life to sh make that mind shift to these are muscle ripping, muscle, muscle building opportunities that if responded to correctly can make that happen, can truly become a strength to you and help you be better. And so you can imagine how his perspective of life changed. If, if I respond as if I volunteered for this because of how incredible the upsides were from what I would learn from this muscle ripping, these challenges, these decisions that you have to make, these responses that you can have. And so 
that just changed everything for me and in dramatic, crazy ways because I noticed that that mindset, even down at the silly level of being stuck in traffic and why would I have volunteered for this? And, oh, well, maybe it's that I listen to a Dan Cooper podcast while I'm sitting here in traffic and I get the most brilliant idea to help in my business and transform our leadership into more character driven. Or that I call my daughter and she just happened to need a call at that time. But then it became any negative thing, act as if you chose it and respond in a way that you will look back and be glad it happened. And so that's how I've tried to transform. So even with losing a son, why would I have volunteered for that? And I have a list and it's a long list. And like people I've met on the plane who've lost a child and to be able to share my journey with them and for them to be helped and inspired, there's a reason. So I write their name down and, and just those kinds of experience. I did a video that 11,000 people watched that came back with lots of comments about how it transformed their response to their adversity, their dis disability, their loss of a family member. And so responding in ways so that when I see my son again, we can high five that we achieve the possible upsides, the muscle building that it offered as an opportunity. And so that's, that's really been a transformation at the business wise. You look at things like AD root cause analysis and how do we make our business. So when these $5 million trucks run into a, a, a hill or something, instead of beating up your programmer who made that one code of that line of code incorrectly. Here's an opportunity to help make us better. Let's make the company stronger. So root cause analysis, we're going to improve these processes. We're going to become a better company and we're going to embrace every negative thing that happens. And so there's no punitive, as you, you talk about compassion and forgiveness as one of the four character traits that transformed me in that way that forgiveness is trivial when you see it as an opportunity to make you better, to make your company better, to make your uh, customers more successful. And that's been a key part of that transformation like Marcus Aurelius and the Stoic philosophers that it happened for us and that we become better through it. I would say that's been the most transformative experience of my life. And that is the perspective that emerged from all of it and has really driven embracing failure, embracing problems and weaknesses and gaps in Mel and the challenges of growing these businesses in these economic times that with macro events can be completely out of your control. Well, I mean, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it reminds me of Victor Frankl's, uh, you know, mind shift, you know, in the, in the concentration camps and what he brought forward in, in, in the service of the psych psychological world, psychology world of, of reframing things and you having the power to reframe it. And it's such an incredible example. Uh, I, I, and again, I, I cheated before we spoke, so I knew about that and it's been affecting me even before we had the chance to sit down and talk and I, and I, uh, I a hundred percent love it. And the other thing that, 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 that we think about sometimes when people think about our fund as a, a character fund, we, they think of it as kind of a moral fund. And, and, and I would say differently in the sense that, you know, good people make mistakes all the time, high character folks, it's how they react to those mistakes is really where character is measured. Now, and yeah. that's, and that's actually the time when, you get to see it, right? Yeah. And uh, and like you said, like the programmer driving a 400-ton machine into a side of a hill. Now, that's a great example, unusual, uh, but it's a time to celebrate a chance to to really 
uh, learn from your mistakes. And, and you know, I, personally, I'm, I'm just so curious about your perspective on how that affects your ability to lead and how that affects your organization in the way it functions, say, when competing or comparing to other purely profit-driven organizations that are, are, are trying to, and maybe they're doing some good things, but maybe they're also ripping apart lives. Um, you know, how have you balanced that within your organization where you're still, you know, you know, feverishly competitive, right? And you're trying to be the best you can be, uh, but, but at the same time, not taking a chapter from some of the, the other examples that we all know in the world where you have founders that, uh, you know, maybe weren't terribly nice uh, <laughs> or were just barbaric in the way they treated human beings within their organization. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this was in one of the videos, but I went through quite a depression. It wasn't clinical, but it was quite a low point for me after I read Steve Jobs' biography by Walter Isaacson and, and just <clears throat> he achieved what we need to achieve, which is we have truck drivers that we need to run an $8 billion mine site that it's a million dollars an hour and you lose a truck, you're bringing in people to do very complex things and you need to make this simple. You need to make it easy to set up, simple to operate and trivial to troubleshoot. And I cannot tell engineers their babies are ugly. Like this is a, a psychologically safe place. And so how do I drive people like he did? Because he did tell them their babies are ugly, you stupid blank blank. Do not come back unless that mouse is fluid in its motion that that iPhone case can get a signal through an aluminum case. It just so many of those stories, how do I get there? And I can't, and I'm in this situation where I feel I've been blessed greatly to be put here to, as most entrepreneurs talk about, there's a luck factor, call it blessings, uh, heavenly intervention to <laughs> help me get where I am, to still be where I am. And I cannot do what I need to do and I'm not capable of it. Like I cannot, because I care so much about the people to tell them their baby's ugly, like he did and push them to do things that they didn't think is possible was a gap I knew I couldn't close. And I prayed for it. I prayed to have my, to, to not give a rip what they think. Uh, to not care about their feelings and tell them their baby's ugly and you need to get that robot doing this or else. We we just have to. And so really sad about that. But then as I work through it, I think you have even mentioned Wall Street, the uh, Harvard Business Review talked about the power of humility. And so I saw that. And then I, I was involved with that. Uh, strategic coach program up in Toronto with Dan Sullivan and about strengths finders then seeing, he said, confidence is your greatest asset as a entrepreneur and figuring out what your strengths are and then building on those and not trying to be someone else. And, and just being reminded of things like Abraham Lincoln's quote about if you'd win a man to your cause, convince them you're a sincere friend. I'm like, Hey, I can do that. I was an engineer. I can build in a different way. And so it even got biblical as I thought about, I was trying to put on Saul's armor, like David and Goliath's story. And I couldn't carry it. Like I couldn't wield the sword of Steve jobs. And I realized I was a slingshot guy and that if I had a humble team around me, we could do anything. If they were coming to me and saying, Hey, here's my baby. How's it look? And uh, how could I make this baby cuter? And how do I, and so they're offering up 
themselves for correction or ideas. And I realized, holy cow, humble is the culture that I can thrive in. And then to see Google come out with their psychological safety principle, which is humble. It is this group where it's a safe place. You can run a mining truck into a wall and Mel is going to look at it as an opportunity to grow. So you can't say anything wrong. You can't do anything that isn't going to be turned into a positive. And if we can have the best ideas of everyone in the room and everyone is offering up their baby for suggestions, we should be able to beat these other companies. We should have the best ideas out of every room, the best solutions out of every team and thrill our customers better than anyone else can. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's a, a genius, simple insight. And it's the, it's the end of the yang of the jobs approach to, to, um, to building greatness and inspiring greatness out of people. And it's something that I'm going to challenge you to write a book on because it's, it's not there. It doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Like this concept in itself does not exist yet. Um, and, uh, and I think it's so critical, um, because I also think it's a, it's a, a risk management tool in the sense that. Um, I, I think most of the bad things in this world can be attributed to a human, human hubris, uh, and arrogance, you know, as it relates to mistakes uh, or even as I would even take it to evil, you know, and by making it a principled standard of being on the T, you know, uh, it, it, that, that takes away a, a ton of uh, set risk potentially, and then also opens up a line of opportunity. And I, and I, I just love it. Um, tell me a little bit about now, if you wouldn't mind how you're structuring your organization as it relates to maybe why your company might be different than other companies, um, as, as you think about, uh, creating as, as Simon, what's his name? The infinite mind guy. Yeah says you're creating an infinite organization. Uh, how are you, how are you building that today? And, uh, what's your vision for your company even after you're gone? Yeah. So again, as I said before with you, that I really felt like Simon Sinek wrote the book that I was going to write one day because it felt like I was alone in the wilderness of people before profit and not going for the big exit and selling your people to the highest bidder. And, and I really felt alone in that, that we were celebrating in industry, the productive narcissist, the. Yeah. Productive narcissist. <laughs> those people yeah. who truly have been disrupting the industry. And we celebrate these serial entrepreneurs who've sold five of their families to the highest bidder. And. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some pretty sad outcomes of, yes, the entrepreneur got to go by his island, but then so many of the people were left behind to those finite games kind of companies that put them so far down on the priority list. And, and so what have we done? We, we made everybody owners. I think that is, as I thought back to us as founders, decision-making was always better when you felt like you were an owner versus a nine to five employee. And so we made everybody owners through the ESOP program and we did the ESOP so that people weren't motivated to the exit so that, Hey, we need to go public or we need to sell us to the highest bidder so I can get my return. The ESOP is a way to uh, move people as they retire and and find a, a compensation way there so that they get a share to the upside. And once I had the Eureka about the slingshot is a humble culture, we immediately put in measures around the values. We started to focus maniacally on how do we hire for a level five leader? How do we measure performance? 
And so we have the humble surveys every quarter where our leadership teams are rated on how are they doing in putting their people first. And we changed our vision statement to a place you'd want to work even when you financially don't have to. And really set that bar high so that every interaction purchasing messes up your order. You go to them and you interact in a way that they would even want to come to work tomorrow if they were millionaires and didn't have to. And so forcing that high bar to drive the interactions in positive ways that, <clears throat> as Joffa Willing said, your extreme ownership, you're both taking responsibility. Can I give you the part numbers in a better way? How could I have helped? And what ideas do you have for me? And that they're both taking ownership. They're all, they're both owners literally. And so they treat each other with respect. They treat each other as if the goal is to make it a journey we want to be on that we're reaching our potential, which is our mission statement. And it's not about profit first, but that we believe putting people first will ultimately lead to greater revenue and profits and longevity. We don't do it because of that, but we have that belief that that will ultimately be the outcome. What, um, how many employees do you have to, and what do you, what do you, one of the things we have to kind of go back to is how you came out of that deep trot. Yeah. And what, where's the company today and, and, uh, where is it going? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the challenge, the big mystery has been, how do you grow and not take that exit driven money that is going to force you to sell your family to the highest bidder and compete against these companies that are getting right now, most of my competitors have between one to 200 million in venture or private equity. And I'm not taking that kind of money. So it's been quite the challenge and a slower path, right? You're not taking a hundred million dollar raise, you're bootstrapping with end users. So for this monster mining company that just gave us the largest contract in the, in the world, it's end user driven. They want the solution. And so they're paying us for both the development and the ultimate resulting product. So. I'd say the, the people have been the key that they'll go through a wall for you if you put them first. And so you do get the loyalty, even when you can't give the big raise or that you may not have the perks of the, all the free meals and all the things that my venture funded competitors are doing. They know they're more important to me than the money. They know that I'm sharing the upside with them, that it's not for my second Ferrari. It's so that they can have that financial freedom. And so I think number one would just be the motivation, the dedication, the, the hard work of the team in very uncertain situations where your end users are saying, we'll pay you for this, but it needs to work by this date. We don't have this massive fund that is propelling us forward and that they're willing to bet on that because they believe in what we're doing. They're treating each other well. So it's a place they love to work, even if they don't have the monster paychecks of some of the other companies. And they believe in that mission. The mission is that infinite game is about making it a place you love to work and helping them reach their potential that we're focused on the training and the, the, the peer mentoring and things like that versus beating our investors or dividends. So I think that's, that's part of it. That's probably the biggest is just incredible people that have just made miracles happen. And I believe that is attributed to the infinite game that we've prioritized and talk about continuously. And then the, I created paper companies for each of the markets that I'm in because 
I'm just turning it over to like-minded people within the organization through the ESOP to perpetuate this place you want to work, even when you financially don't have to and people first, not take an exit driven money. So I created separate markets for the mining company, the ag company, and then opened up each of those two investors that are strategic, that won't ever force an exit that need the product. So the valuation is actually higher because they value the technology. And so I was able to get an investor on the mining side. That's a company that has the world's largest drill manufacturer, and they want the autonomous technology for their drills. And they have a dealer network around the world. And so they're very aligned with where we're going. And they were able to help us with some money that helped us ultimately get to the product place where uh, we just won that largest contract. And then after that, the world's largest tech investor, SoftBank came to us and said, Hey, we want to do golf course mowing. We want to do logistics trucks for the, the Amazon, the Walmarts, the distribution centers. And we said, well, we're not doing an exit driven investment. We're not going public. And so they were excited enough to be involved that we created a framework around the investment where they were able to get returns from the product over time instead of an exit. And it was just huge. Their flexibility, their willingness to partner in that way so that we could keep our culture, keep our people. And, and so that's been helping with these additional products. So it's a platform based technology with these different markets that we're able to adapt the technology, like an app on your phone. And actually like the golf course, you do run it from your phone. So you're running it from the, the golf the sand traps, uh, with a cell phone in your pocket to run the fleet of mode. It's such a fun space. I mean, it's, it's so tangible and it's, uh, understanding for those of you, uh, that don't quite grasp it, go to the ASI uh, website and watch some of the videos of the things that these, this, this company creates and generates. Um, it's, it's pretty, well, it's almost sci-fi like you're starting to see some of the stuff we see in the movies coming to life. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Mel, uh, well, listen, I, you've given me so much of your time. Uh, this was such a, so it's such a gift, a blessing for, for all of us to get to listen to your story. Uh, know that uh, I'm cheering you on from the bleachers every day uh, and, and hoping that your company continues to be successful and that your example grows uh, throughout the business world. Um, I just want to say thanks, and uh, I appreciate you coming on Return on Character podcast. Well, it's been an honor. You are perpetuating this in such a big way compared to what we're able to do with your fund. And like with Simon Sinek, uh, if I was going to start a fund, this is the exact kind I would that would just really celebrate and try to find those people that are putting people first, that are prioritizing character and one, helping them financially be more successful but also like you found with your 5X return, prove to the world, prioritize this, have us as college students aspire to be that instead of the ruthless that we tend to celebrate in the media. So I'm thrilled with what you're doing. Uh, just honored to be part of this uh, conversation and sure appreciate the honor. Oh, well, we're going to be, I hope friends for life. So thanks again for, uh, for your time. Thank you, Dan. Take care.